It's now time for questions to the Minister for Education, and we will start with listed questions. Initiate him, Sir Richie McPhillips. I now call Mr. Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister of Education outline how the Education Authority's Providing Pathways Draft Strategy Area Plan for School Provision 2017 to 20 will affect schools in Fermanagh South Tyrone? Minister. Thank you, thank you Member, for clarifying question one. Um, the Draft Strategic Area Plan for Northern Ireland Providing Pathways focuses on the education interests of children and young people. It aims to ensure all pupils have access to a broad and balanced curriculum that meets their needs delivered by schools that are education and financially viable. In the development of the Draft Strategic Area Plan for 2017-20, uh, the Education Authority, working with uh, CCMS and the other sectoral support bodies, have analysed the current position and identified key strategic themes and issues which are impacting on the education system. The draft strategic area plan, it's important to note this is out at consultation at present, so we're not at the final stage on it, doesn't identify individual schools, but will act as a catalyst for discussion at regional and local level. The school planning and managing authorities will engage at local level to determine the most appropriate uh, area solutions uh, to ensure that children and young people have access to high quality education, regardless of where they live. So the aim at this stage is really to look very much on a Northern Ireland wide basis, while there is direct references to the 11 council areas. Schools will be involved in the process at a formative stage and will have the opportunity to inform the development of the area solutions. Richard McPhillips for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. The Minister will be aware that, that the statement on education authorities' plan has caused great concern for rural schools with traditionally lower pupil numbers. What assurances can the Minister give that rural proofing legislation will be properly considered so that no rural pupil loses out and that there will be no redundancies for teachers or other staff in the rural schools? Well, from that point of view, I mean, just tackling a couple of those points on it. Um, first of all, we, we've always got to focus in, at times we focus in very much on the schools in that sense. What we've actually got to do is ensure that there's proper provision of education for the children. And I have to say, there is an issue that I've highlighted already where we have particularly um, composite classes, particularly when it's situations of more than two years, that there is a, a danger that, that that has not been able to provide the best possible education for people. Uh, on the basis of that, but certainly we bear intention to ensure uh, that a, effectively a strategic look is taken at, at schools to try and ensure that we don't have isolated communities, that if you like there is some level of provision within that. Uh, so, and mention, I think, the second or third part of his, his supplementary was on the basis of teacher redundancies. I think from that point of view, what has happened in the past and I think would continue to happen would be that transferred redundancies would be looked at as the, the way of doing that, where a particular school to close uh, on that or amalgamate. And I think within the system, uh, there is enough provision that that is something which can be taken care of. And that's something which uh, in the past EA or CCMS as the managing authorities have been able to, to do because there's other teachers who will be looking to retire. And I think that uh, Transfer redundancies are the route to try and avoid. I think we all want to avoid any situation which is any form of compulsory redundancy. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sp Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, given that, given that the financial context of savings is a major section in that draft plan consultation document, could, could you therefore give details as to how much money will actually be saved by the implementation of the draft area plan and where the money is committed to being spent? Well, with respect on it, uh, I, would, I would say a couple of things. I wouldn't accept that the savings issue is a major issue within the draft area plan. The focus within the draft area plan is on ensuring that there is good provision in terms of education, and that is the, the key focus within that. Now, the issue in terms of I think we all have to recognise that there's a degree of, of financial uh, constraints and that if, for example, you have a situation in which within the school state there are changes to the school state, uh, if that produce reduced pressures on issues around, for example, the small schools factor, which is part of that, that is money which will recirculate within the aggregated schools budget. It is not a question of schools uh, in any way money being taken away from them, but there's going to be a set amount ultimately which is available to schools and the distribution of that will depend upon the number and location of schools there. At the moment, we have a situation that because we have a schools estate that is not fit for purpose, that a lot of schools out there are not getting the level of spending and support which, which they should be getting in relation to that. And I think there is, 
you know, I appreciate members from all parties in all locations will fight for their own particular area. But we've also got to look at this in a mature way and a strategic way, which actually said, what is the best possible delivery of our education? How do we actually cope with a, 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 an educational state which is not fit for purpose, which is not meeting demands in terms of maintenance, which is not meeting educational needs? So I think that that level of, of mature discussion, but it is not a question of money being taken out of education. It's a question of if the pressures are in different uh, spheres on it, then the money will be recirculated within uh, the school's budget. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Education Minister uh, how his failure to support the 1% pay increase for teachers in 2015-16 will affect area planning for schools? Good attempt to, uh, to uh, shoehorn that in, because I don't think it has any particular impact in terms of area planning on it. And, you know, uh, from that point of view, I think that there are, uh, we need to be responsible in terms of both the language we use and also the fact that the money that actually wasn't there in terms of 15-16, in terms of that 1%. Let's remember that the overall wage bill for schools over the last two years will have gone up as a result of the pay settlements by 2.61%. And so, for example, the position in terms of 15-16 and 16-17 is that all teachers below the top level will receive automatic increments. That is not the case in England, Scotland and Wales in that regard. So there is a contrast there on that side of it. In terms of area planning, the need is a focus on what the best delivery of the school's estate is. And what individual teachers will get paid is not particularly relevant to area planning. And I think we shouldn't be trying to conjoin the issues, even in a desperate attempt for some level of headline. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Could the Minister tell the House today what will happen uh, to the area plan at the end of the consultation period? The consultation period, as you know, has been launched. It's due to complete on the 12th of December. It's an education authority uh, consultation, and the education authority will then have the responsibility for analysing the responses, present a report on the issue raised during the consultation, and that will then inform their final strategic plan, which will be then for consideration in the new year. The key objective, I think, in terms of area plan has, uh, has identified the main issues to be addressed. Uh, which is a network of education in financially viable schools. Once we get to that stage, the annual area plan will then, an annual area plan will supplement the strategic area plan. So it will be for 17, 18, another one for 18, 19, and one for 1920. It will contain details of the work programme of the planning and management authorities to address specific issues at local level. The area planning is a continuum, um, and this will be reflected in the annual area plan. This will in turn, I suppose, lead then to individual development proposals uh, in terms of schools, which will then have to go through a proper legal process, and that will be where the direct uh, impact will be. Uh, you know, there are, I think, a, a number of significant issues, I think, that will be addressed. It's not possible, I think, to tackle everything at once, uh, and therefore the aim, particularly of the, the three-year plan, is to identify priorities over a three-year period and then drill down into those into um, annual plans. I want to thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Does the Minister accept that there is no body or educational evidence or research to back up assertion that competent class or one year groups uh, produce pure educa uh, poor educational outcomes? On the contrary, there's some evidence in relation to this, and I think particularly with the differences, there's a limited amount of difference where you get um, children taught in a, a two-year composite class, although there's a level of dif additional differentiation there which does make it difficult for the, the teacher. If you speak to the Education and Training Inspectorate, they will say that there is a, they see a, a considerable difference where you move beyond a simple two-year composite class, where you, you move into settings where there are three years or more within a single class because a teacher is therefore trying to provide such a level of differentiation that it does have a level of impact. Uh, and they, you know, with that is something which ETI have, have raised. I, I simply feel that a situation, and given the amount and the volume of classes that are uh, in composite classes, that will, you know, there will be composite classes that will continue on into the future. There are some very good teachers out there. I think the issue is that once you get that issue of differentiation and you get the issue of composite classes, it does make it more difficult for teachers, and it is not the ideal uh, situation. I call Paula Bradshaw for a question. Thank you. Question two, please. 
Uh, thank the member for their question. Uh, the Education Authority published three development proposals for Forge Integrated on the 20th of October 2016, as I'm sure the members are aware. But for the benefit of the House, uh, the three proposals relate to uh, relocate the school to the former Knockbreda High School site, to establish a 52 place part time nursery unit, uh, and establish a autism spectrum disorder centre at Key Stage 1 and a general learning support centre at Key Stage 2. The publication on the 20th of October has, has triggered a two-month um, objection consultation period, during which my department will take receipt of any um, issues that, that have been raised by people, both in terms of objections and also expressions of support for each of those individual applications. The objection period, or the period of, of development proposal period, will end on the 20th of December. Uh, my officials will then compile and assess all pertinent information before they will then make a recommendation to me, and I'll consider all the information and advice before taking a decision in the context of my department's statutory duties, stated priorities and policies. Now, I'm sure as the member will appreciate that as the final decision maker, uh, legally I will have to then give a decision on that, so therefore I can't discuss the details of the individual proposals today that are part of those development proposals. I can assure you, however, that I'll endeavour to complete the process that I've outlined to you as quickly as possible, uh, but time taken can vary on the individual circumstances and complexity of each proposal. Uh, my decision will then, and this is with all development proposals, will conclude the process, and then the issues around implementation, if implementation is then to be required of my decision, is a matter for the Education Authority, as this is a controlled integrated school. Okay, Paula Bradshaw for supplementary. Um, thank you, Minister. Can I ask then if it's almost like a hypothetical question, if you um, believe that this proposal could fit within the Shared Education Campuses programme in terms of its capital funding? And if not, where would you imagine that funding will come from? Uh, I tend to say I have enough difficulty with real questions without adding hypothetical ones into the, into the position. In terms of um, the, the issue of uh, fresh start in that regard, uh, obviously, as part of that, there are tranches of, of available funding in terms of Fresh Start. And um, in terms of the Fresh Start funding, Forge Integrated has been selected to receive a new school build under the Fresh Start funding announcement made in March 2016. And that new build project is then being led by the Education Authority. Now, those um, undergo, if you like, a particular sort of standard set of, of, of actions that, that take place. And I suppose the advantage is the more that, as a department and the Education Authority, are directly involved in new school build the more familiar they get with the, the processes. Um, so the project itself, in terms of a new, new build for Forge Integrated, uh, it's in the early stages, and the department continues to work with EA as required. On the 27th of uh, April of this year, an engagement event was held with all the schools that were announced on the 23rd of, of March. I think there's 15 in total for funding under the Fresh Start. Um, I think the next step within those are our site searches being commissioned and that is the case, I think, with any new capital build, um, even, in, even on occasions where and I occasionally have members who will raise with me that there is a very obvious place for a particular school to go. But there is always site searches commissioned with any um, new capital build, and work is underway to develop procurement uh, documentation to engage integrated design teams. I would also say, as with any proposal, barring any change which I have no control over, once a particular school has been announced for a new build, it will, will happen on that basis on it. So it's not a question of there any particular doubt over, over the issue of a, a capital bill. The issue, obviously, of the development proposals will have to be considered uh, separately legally. I call Claire Bailey. I'd just like to ask the Minister that given the consistent high demand and indeed in some cases over subscription, does the Minister feel that there is adequate provision of integrated education places in South Belfast? Well, I think that would press from that point of view on it, I'm aware of the, the broader issues as regards that. I think it would be difficult to deal with the issues of the precise level of availability within South Belfast without touching upon the development proposals themselves. And in dealing with development proposals, I can't be in a position where I can show uh, or have anything which can be demonstrated, which can either be taken as in favour or against a particular development proposal. So there's a limited amount of detail, as I said, that I can, I can get into. But I know that uh, there has been um, there has been some work has on gone on, which was commissioned by the previous minister, on a strategic view, review in terms of integrated education. I look forward to looking into the detail of that um, whenever I'm able to, to deal with it. I call Carla Lockhart. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. You have already touched on this, Minister, but can you outline to this House how the Department of Education will ensure that Fresh Start Agreement funding is fully maximised? I want to try and make sure uh, that it is fully maximised. I think we got a situation where this was able to be secured by the Executive. Um, it came, I suppose, both with opportunities and also constraints within that. I think it's, it's probably fair to say that there wasn't maybe a, a great enthusiasm from Treasury to sign up to everything uh, within Fresh Start. And obviously, the, the Fresh Start funding will be both for integrated and shared education, and also uh, there's a, there will be some funding for um, shared housing. I want to make sure that, that what is there, the maximum amount is used. So we're continuing to engage with the Northern Ireland Office uh, on that. And we're working to identify um, future projects. So, from that point of view, obviously, we've had the initial call, which has resulted in, in 15. There's further calls have gone out, and indeed, um, I initiated a new call for shared edu education campuses as well just a few weeks ago. I think the issue as well is that if there are ways that we can widen how things can be done. So, at the moment, obviously, the focus within uh, the Fresh Start in terms of it is on pure new capital funding. But, for example, if we can ensure that there's a role for a fresh start in, for the integrated sector in terms of the widening the, the pool for, for example, school enhancement programme. That is something which, which could be used. I think there are also issues which, again, lie directly outside my control, but I think we want to raise, particularly with the Northern Ireland Office, around end year flexibility as well, because we have a situation where the provision within Fresh Start was effectively 50 million for each of 10 years. If it's not spent within that one particular year, then that money effectively goes unspent and particularly with new capital build it's not something that you can just start on one day and have the money spent within a year it will take a degree of time so the more flexibility that we can get from the Northern Ireland office and treasury the more we can actually maximize the amount of money which is going into the into the schools bill uh, via the fresh start uh, agreement I call Gordon Lyons for a question thank you mr deputy speaker question number 3 right the department thank the member for his question the department's, uh, Department of Education's total capital spend in East Antrim for the mentioned obviously uh, five years, but for the full five financial years since 2011-12 is 18.5 million. Uh, the spend that we have directly for the current year, I don't have figures directly at, at that stage. Major capital programme for uh, St Killian's College, Island McGee Primary School, Corn Integrated Primary School, Abbey uh, Community uh, College. Ulidia College and uh, Woodburn uh, Primary School have all been announced and advanced in terms of planning. Work to deliver these projects is being advanced uh, jointly by the Department and the Education Authority. I will be quizzing members on how well they have noted the names of all those schools uh, at a later stage. Mr Lyons for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I, can I thank the Minister for his answer and can I also impress upon him uh, the need there is for um, capital expenditure in East Antrim, particular uh, minor works with a lot of schools coming to me with, with a lot of need. Uh, in particular, would he be able to update the house on Isla McGee Primary School and the new build for there, which is uh, much anticipated by local people? Yeah, I'm aware. I mean, the new build primary school for Isla McGee area, I think, was originally included in the January 2013 capital announcement. It was subsequently withdrawn uh, due to a change in the basis in which the project had been included. Um, on the 24th of September 2014, the former Education Minister made the decision that the development proposal agreed in 2004 uh, to amalgamate uh, and Mulldog, Mulldog? Mulldog. Mulldog. I, I bow to local knowledge uh, in terms of pronunciation, primary schools to create um, the New Island McGee uh, Primary School remained extant. The decision allowed the project to be included in the March 2016 capital investment announcement. So, as a result from that, a project board with specific responsibility for the new build project for Island McGee Primary School was established on the 27th of June 2016 with representation from the school, the Education Authority, and the Department of Education to ensure that there are effective governance structures um, in. Uh, for the delivery of the project. And can I say as well, again, once we've reached the stage where there has been that announcement in terms of capital build, that will be moving, moving ahead and the processes will, will be moving forward. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The development of Island McGee Primary School has been rather torturous, emanating in the early 2000s and been taking more than a decade. So can the Minister assure us 
that the split site that the school is now operating on will increase the priority in which the funding will actually be allocated and ensure us there will be no further delays. And given that planning permission has now been delivered for Woodburn Primary School, when will these schools both be actually built? <clears throat> right, I'll, I'll pick from the, the range of questions. I appreciate the, the, the strong involvement that the member has had with this in, uh, in relation to that. Uh, in terms of the speed of movement, I think uh, that will be up to the project board, but there will not be any unnecessary delays. I appreciate the point that was made that there was a, a previous commitment back over a decade ago, and indeed in a situation where um, I think there was anticipation um, 10 years ago of ever sort of ever increasing capital amounts, there was a situation in which there was a lot of projects were given a, a level of green light and then the plug pulled on them. Can I indicate, I think, as part of that, that the department has learned from that, that position. It is only those projects which then meet gateway check and are then in a position, therefore, to move ahead, which get that, that green light. Uh, I can't give specific dates in terms of um, when, that, when it will move ahead to completion. But as I said, the, the project board, which brings it forward and, and irons out all the details and makes the arrangements, um, has been established. And therefore, this will be something that, that, that will be happening. And there won't be sort of any undue delay uh, within that. Call Stuart Dixon. Um, I appreciate that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in relation to constituency specific uh, subject. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to the Minor Works Programme, what action he proposes to take, having had his predecessor uh, to visit the totally inadequate in outdoor uh, boys' and girls' toilets at Green Island Primary School, which were put up in the 1930s uh, and to this day are totally and wholly inadequate uh, for, for children in the modern age? The direct as regards, as regards minor works are ultimately for the education authority. However, I think that um, whereas I think it's been widely accepted that we're in a very tight regime as regards resources, it is hopeful that we'll see, and we will know a little bit better by um, roughly speaking about a week's time, that in a capital side of things, things should, should improve. Uh, I suppose, as with all issues in terms of minor works, it's, it's a question of prioritisation, and I appreciate that from what you've indicated, this is something that is... Uh, I suppose to, to use um, a sort of a slight misquote out of a, a most of a popular uh, party tune. It is old, but it is not beautiful uh, in uh, in that location. Uh, and as such, I think uh, action obviously will need to be taken to, to rectify that. But there are a lot of calls on, on minor works. I call Stuart Dixon for a question. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, yeah, so just a bit of natural flow in that regard. Um, the statutory curriculum taught in all schools includes citizenship education, uh, which enables young people to participate positively and effectively in society, to play their part in democratic processes, and to make informed and responsible decisions as citizens throughout their lives. At primary level, it's part of the area of learning, personal development, mutual understanding, and pupils look at diversity, cultural heritage, promoting inclusion, human rights, causes of and responses to conflict, and playing an active and meaningful part in the community, all of which contribute, I think, to turning children away from involvement in legal paramilitary organisations. Specifically, at post-primary level, local and global citizenship uh, is part of the uh, area of learning, uh, learning for life and work. Pupils explore issues such as diversity, prejudice and racism, promoting inclusion and reconciliation, mutual respect, equality and human rights, social justice and exclusion, democracy and participation through global uh, examples. I could also say that in addition to that, um, there is also, because we sometimes, as maybe mentioned earlier on, purely focus on what's happening within the, the classroom, uh, also directly my, uh, my department would provide funding to the Education Authority on, under the Youth Intervention Programme. That is to support uh, young people at times of community tension and unrest, and that fund last year was a little bit over 800,000, and that program uh, targeted programs enable, to enable individuals often at risk of involvement in paramilitary activity to, to, if you like, create diversionary activity, and I think that's an important uh, part of this as well. In terms of specific programs, particularly within schools, I'm not aware of a specific program within schools within East Antrim per se, uh, but the aspects that are within the curriculum have outlined, I hope will deter children from involvement in illegal and paramilitary activities. I don't think anybody wants to see children going down the wrong route in life, and whether it's through paramilitary activity or other criminal activity. That is something that I think we've all got to 
play our part in ensuring that we divert people away from that, that particular line. Mr. Dixon, for a supplementary. Uh, and can I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Uh, Minister, you'll appreciate that given both the imminent and real danger to young people in East Antrim, particularly in Cary, Fergus and Larne, that intervention is vitally important in terms of how uh, we support our young people in these communities, particularly in respect of the uh, dealing with paramilitaries, the executive agreed an action plan, and that action plan includes uh, an early intervention transformation plan. Have you met with that board, and what action will you be taking with the early intervention transformation plan right, I mean, board I'm, I'm to committed. deal with this matter? As yet, I haven't had a direct meeting with them, but I'm, I'm happy to work alongside them. And if we need to do the things in a multi-agency way or multi-department way, I think that that's something that I'd be keen to embrace. Because I think both in terms of the threat to society and also in terms of the, the threat to the individual young people, uh, you know, the opportunity and the, the, the danger, if you like, of young people going down a pathway, which both in terms of the potential risk that they create to society, the potential deaths, injuries, damage to property, you know, that is, is bad enough. But added to that, there's a danger of leaving a young person themselves scarred for life, creating a criminal record which will impact on their, their lives throughout that. And I think it's any steps that we can take to divert that, I, and I'd be happy to meet with anybody to uh, prove that. I'll also directly, in terms of, uh, I'll try and get some detail and send to the member in terms of any particular activities that EA has planned within East Antrim and get some information to the, the member on that as well. Here, I'm Sir Oliver McMullen. I call Oliver McMullen. Can, call you, and can I thank the Minister for his questions or his answers so far? But Minister, can you, can you give me your department's assessment of the harm that culture of paramilitary activity and domination in parts of Carrick and Larne is having on the educational attainment of young people and children? And the, and in the absence, if they're in the absence of an assessment, will your department consider carrying out that assessment? on the, the, the education attainment of children and young people in Carrick and in Lard. Well, I'm not sure there's a great deal of point in, in doing a very, something that is very so specifically location uh, orientated. I think what we do have is we still have various parts in Northern Ireland in which there is still paramilitary activity and paramilitary organisations, unfortunately on both sides of the, the community. Uh, there is a clear, as I indicated, damage to the lives of young people who get involved. They should be discouraged from uh, any such activity. And it is both in terms of their future long term prospects, in terms of criminal records, in terms of risk to their own lives, let alone the damage that they do to others, but also, as you indicate, in terms of the, uh, the impact that that will have on their educational opportunities and the damage that is done. Now, from that point of view, I think we need to look at this at how we can do this throughout Northern Ireland rather than necessarily, if, if there are specific interventions that can happen within a constituency. Uh, I'm happy for the EA to be doing those, and they will know what perhaps needs to be done directly on the ground. In terms of any form of audit in that regard, I think it's something that needs to be taken forward on a much wider basis to ensure that, that all the areas where there are problems are properly dealt with. I call Philip Logan for a brief question and brief answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what uh, progress he's made on implementing the plans within the Fresh Start Agreement on tackling paramilitary activity? I suppose just to add to what's been said already. Uh, the CCS provided outline costs for the development of curriculum materials to, to address the issue of paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime, and those materials, I think, will support delivery of the citizenship education in the curriculum designed to raise awareness and develop understanding of active citizenship lawfulness. I think one of the, the issues, to some extent, that I think where we've got to be mindful of in terms of young people, um, most of us are, are of a generation that we knew what happened throughout the Troubles, and we knew, if you like, the, the damage that was done to society as a whole. I think there are a lot of young people growing up to which this is simply a historic event, and we've got to make sure that, that young people don't mistake, repeat the mistakes of previous generations, and therefore I think it's got to be brought home to young people the damage that can be caused both to them and society. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. I guess here I'm sir, Jerry Mullen. I call Jerry Mullen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, can you provide the House uh, with an update on any discussions you have had with teachers' unions uh, in respect of pay concerns, especially the National Association, or the National, um, Association of Schoolmasters and Women, uh, considering that they are going to have a one-day strike next month? Well, 
I appeal on people to show restraint and not be involved directly in a strike. We are in a position, as indicated, uh, there has been discussions have been ongoing for the last year or two. I mean, don't forget, we're talking about an issue, particularly with regard to the 15-16 pay settlement, which actually was never sorted out during 15-16. Uh, and there were various offers made, I understand, from management side to the unions, which then weren't accepted at various stages on it, and those negotiations broke down. I think there's a willingness to have discussion on it, but the reality is there isn't any more money. And we're in a situation where, in terms of the, um, of the as I said, teachers have received over the, uh, the last 15, 16, 16, 17, an increase in terms of the pay bill of 2.61%. We've got to take into account increments. And what it does mean is for 15, 16, that every teacher in Northern Ireland who had a salary below 37,500 will be seeing a pay increase last year. So, we, you know, We've got to deal with this in the degree of, of objective facts. There is a tough financial regime out there in terms of schools, and the reality is that the more, while I'm sure there is a strong desire to see additional pay, the more we push up pay, the more in current circumstances with school budget that is going to lead to further redundancies. And I think there is also going to be a balance to be struck between greater levels of pay and teachers losing their jobs. And I think that's also going to be borne as well. On I don't have any additional money to throw at this particular issue. Jerry Mullen for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, thank you for your answer so far, and I understand what you're trying to say, but would you not agree that our teachers are as equally as hardworking and dedicated and committed as any other teachers within the GB, uh, and they are entitled and should be entitled to the same levels of pay and not be lagging two years behind? Well, on it, they're not lagging two years behind. That's an inaccuracy. And it is also the case that every teacher below the top level received an increment for 15-16, will receive an increment for 16-17, and pay increase for 16-17. Pay increments, if you go to England, automatic pay increments were abolished a number of years ago. So it is not, in that sense, like, like for like. And if people want to then have like for like, then there are other consequences of that, that as well. So you know, I think we've actually got to get to the facts of the situation rather than necessarily always looking to uh, see where there is parity when it suits and other occasions where, where it doesn't, that just gets ignored. I call Adrian McQuillan for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister provide an update on the new guidance on the transfer test which he announced lately? Well, there's a couple of aspects to this. Obviously, there was an announcement made in terms of guidance to primary schools in terms of preparation, um, and that is the giving people a sort of permissive environment for primary schools to be able to prepare children on uh, issues around practice tests, around, I suppose, a level of coaching of, of uh, tests, familiarisation with the uh, with facilities, and even if there's agreement to have the, the tests hosted within primary schools. In addition to that, I think that I'm looking to see. I accept that realistically there won't be an agreement on selection between um, the two government parties. Indeed, there's a very great chasm within this uh, within this chamber on the issue. I'm realistic enough that there isn't going to be agreement. I'm not going to look for some sort of short-term fix either for the next couple of years in that, in that regard. As such, then, the efforts to see what can be done to make life easier for the children going through transfer, and one aspect of that is to try to see if we can get the two tests, two sets of tests that are there at present, in terms of PPTC and AQE, to see if we can reach an agreement on whether there can be then uh, a single agreed set of, of tests. To that extent, then, I've, I've uh, appointed an independent um, expert from outside Northern Ireland who therefore maybe doesn't have the same connections with Northern Ireland to see if he can facilitate discussions. But those are at the very early stage within that. Adrian Quillen for a supplementary. Yeah. Can I thank the Minister for his, his answer so far? Minister, I have very positive feedback on the announcements. And do you think yourself that these changes will encourage more parents to enter their kids for these exams? There's a considerable amount, there are a considerable number of, of um, pupils who are renting transfer tests. And I think people can debate around the merits of it. That is very much a fact of life. It's also a fact of life. But clearly, given the level of demand, the transfer tests are here to stay. So from that point of view, I think those are always going to be individual choices for individual parents uh, as to what action they take in connection with that. I suppose my role, therefore, I see, is to try to make the pathway as easy indeed as possible and not throw, to a certain extent, artificial barriers in their way or artificial barriers in schools, in schools' ways to try to make sure uh, that that provision, if you like, is, is provided 
in what is always going to be a difficult issue, which is that of transfer, that it's done in a way which doesn't add additional stress to the situation. Raymond McCartney for when you cashed. I call Raymond McCartney for a question. Graham, I've got a last one. Cooler, I can ask the, the Minister if, if he is content or satisfied with the, the number of educational psychologists that, that are, are needed to carry out assessments on, on young children and indeed young adults. Well, in terms of educational psychologists, I mean, there's an issue which, uh, from that point of view, is a sort of joint working between the Department of Education and Health. I think there are, I think, gaps within that, and I think that's where we're hoping to try and uh, close those in terms of numbers. Uh, and as such, I'm happy to work with, uh, with my colleague at the Executive in, in Health in trying to ensure that we actually get timely interventions, because I think mention has been made earlier on today when we were debating autism, for example, uh, that one of the problems is early diagnosis, which principally lies, lies with health, but I think there's a joint responsibility in that regard. And the sooner that we can get to a degree of diagnosis um, and indeed therefore action then to be able to, to rectify some problems. You know, I think that will be advantageous to everybody. Raymond McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I kind of thank the Minister for his answer. I just wonder, in, in terms of why he waits to have that sort of discussion with the, the Minister for Health, is there any particular actions which he feels he could take perhaps to help reduce the waiting times, even in the short term? I mean, I think we need to take a look. I think strategically, I think we need to actually take a look at what actions we can, that can be taken, which can ensure there's a smoother process, full stop in relation to it. I should also indicate as well, whatever the direct contacts are there between myself um, and Michelle O'Neill in relation to that, there is ongoing work with the two departments in terms of the officials level. And I think as part of the, um, the, particularly the special education and needs bill that went through last year, part of that was to have a much more greater sense of joined up working within that. So there's that liaison between officials. What we need to ensure is that, that while there's good work going on at departmental level, that that permeates then into the, into the groundwork and we get that sort of delivery for, uh, for young children. I call Steve Aiken for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And thank you, the Minister, for his uh, answer so far. Uh, could I ask the Minister of Education to outline the reasons for the proposed closure of half of our eight outdoor residential activity centres? particularly as many studies have shown that building relationships, building leadership skills and giving our children a much valued sense of the outdoors are some of the key things for development. Twelve um, outdoor centres, it's reducing from 12 to 8, so the member seems to have missed out on four of them. Uh, the position is it's, it's a proposal by the Education Authority. There was an assessment done in 2015 of what the needs were in terms of outdoor activity, which concluded that we needed about eight instead of 12 on that basis. So this is following through from that. There is no doubt also that that is also uh, a product of the pressures that are there financially. The Education Authority this year has had its budget reduced by about 20 million. There's also 20 million pounds worth of pressures. Now, that is the situation in terms of the overall budget. Uh, there's also got to be a realisation, though, and to be fair to the previous minister, and something I've tried to do as well, I've tried directly as much as possible to protect the frontline schools' budget. That means probably disproportionately, to be fair to them, the Education Authority has had to bear uh, that weight of responsibility. I think everyone is aware of uh, the good work that is being done in terms of outdoor education centres. There will be still availability of, of that through any new scheme. But it's also going to be a situation that if the Education Authority has got to make a level of cuts, then I think it's also incumbent on people. There, there are certain things that can happen in terms of voluntary redundancies and that type of thing. That won't close the, the entire gap. So if, 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 for example, as a result of this exercise, there's a determination which says, no, the, these aren't the right cuts, they should be, then there will also be a onus on people to say, in a responsible fashion, where the other cuts should come from. But we're at a consultation process. I think those are the arguments that should be made. I suppose the other issue which people will also have to consider is if there's going to be a reduction in terms of the outdoor uh, centres, are these the right places, the right particular ones to remove? And I think that's also got to be borne in mind in terms of any discussion. Steve Aiken for a supplementary. May I apologise for the Minister? I meant eight large outdoor activity centres rather than the overall number of outdoor activity centres. But I, I think in your answer as well, one of the questions we have to have are the identified savings of 1.5 million. Are there specific areas that you're looking to use those savings from? And like some of the other activities we're doing, 
Are you looking to use those for things like adventurous training, leadership and teamwork, and how can we do that? It's not a question of that money being hypothecated in that regard. I mean, first of all, I would indicate that the issue with this is that the Education Authority has a budget. The decision in terms of the outdoor centres are a decision ultimately for them on that. The issue is they have to live within budget. If this was, I think, to be fair, it, there would not be the same compelling case for change financially if it was simply a question of 1.5 million or whatever any particular saving is then simply being redirected into another activity. I think the argument would be then that probably what is there um, isn't particularly broke, wouldn't need fixing in that regard. The issue on it is that in terms of the pressures that are there for a range of activities, some of which, for example, we are having increasing costs, for instance, in terms of meeting special needs education, which are going up year on year. So you're getting a, a level of pressure there. You're getting a situation that in terms of um, the overall share of the budget, the department's budget was reduced in 16-17. The Education Authority, to be fair to them, bore a disproportionate amount of that. They are having to make, make ends meet. So I think it's not a question of them recycling that money into, it's a question of trying to ensure that they remain within budget, which is a requirement they have to do. It's a requirement I have to do with the budget that I have as well. I call Christopher Stolford for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Sir, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister to outline what provision is planned for early years in the South Belfast constituency over the course of the next five years? Hey, well, look, the aim in terms of preschool is to try to make sure there is a preschool place available uh, for every child in the immediate preschool year. And that, I think, is also something that is an aim of the programme for government, indeed part of the, the draft programme for government, and plan to continue. Um, so therefore, I think the, uh, the preschool education advisory group in the EA have direct responsibility for ensuring there is adequate preschool provision uh, in local areas and make allocation of funded places and local need. Within South Belfast, um, for 1617, uh, every child in South Belfast constituency whose parents stayed with the admissions process to the end received the offer of a preschool place. That is something I want to ensure that continues on, and we have that level of adequate provision uh, for those, not simply in South Belfast, uh, but throughout, uh, throughout all of Northern Ireland. I call Christopher Stalford for supplementary. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will know that, uh, as well as preschool places, Sure Start plays a very valuable and important role, uh, particularly in helping people from uh, deprived communities to get back into work. Uh, what provision and support is there for Sure Start in South Belfast? Across Northern Ireland as a whole, there is about a current investment of around £25 million per year, which is administered by Health and Social Care Board under uh, a service level agreement with the Department of Education. And there are 39 Sure Start projects across Northern Ireland. Specifically in South Belfast, the core budget for 1617 for South Belfast Sure Start was £920,000. The Sure Start project involves services to legacy wards, uh, as was prior to the rejigging of the, of the boundaries within Belfast, of Balnafy, Shaftesbury, Botanic, Blackstaff, Upper Malone, which includes, despite its name, includes Tokmona and Benmore, uh, and through the expansion of services also to Millowburn as part of the Beach Hill Ward, which falls within the Beaver Estate. Uh, additionally, to the, uh, to the ongoing sort of resource costs, uh, the Department has made a capital investment totalling £359,000 in 2015-16 for the purchase and refurbishment of the former uh, Beaver Clinic premises to enable expansion of, of South Belfast Sure Start. Paul, Paul Frew for a brief question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, I have been contacted by many principals of schools in my area of North Antrim. In regards to the Education Authority's maintenance department, who are telling principals that there are, has been no budget for maintenance work uh, since the start of the financial year, can the Minister shed some light on that? And since I probably not get a supplementary, can I also ask the Minister that given that you are going to give more power to principals with regards to school budget, can he give us a, uh, an update on that also, please? I think that's what you call in shopping terms to get two for one offer in that regard. Um, it's not true that there hasn't been any money. We, the level of maintenance budget uh, through the EA, through the department in that sense, has been about 14 million for this year. Uh, that probably, in terms of what is needed, is less than what ultimately is needed, and that means that things have had to be prioritised on a very much a basis of health and safety. Uh, on that, as regards, um, I, 
wrote to school principals in the last week or so and schools to indicate their views on greater levels of autonomy. And I think there's a good argument that if there are particular parts of the budget that could be better utilised by schools themselves in a more sensible fashion, I'm very open to that. That um, correspondence is fairly open-ended in terms of suggestions, so it doesn't concentrate on particular aspects such as maintenance or procurement, for instance, but can very easily be brought back as a, a response from schools in relation to that. Time is now up. 